password? Password? I'm just here for the beer. Okay. It's been a day. Can I get a craft beer, please? Hey, how do you showcase your seasonal beers? Amazing! How about labels? I can't get them to stick. All right, how do you stand out amongst 3,000 different breweries? Glenmore is small to medium size, uh, folding cart manufacturer, labor manufacturer, uh, shrink sleeve and tube manufacturer. We don't approach challenges like anyone else. We don't fall back on what's being done or what's comfortable or what's easy. I think we really, really care about what we do. We're really passionate about the product and I've been really lucky to surround myself with people who are also passionate about the product. Everybody kind of pushes everybody forward and customer and product is first and that drives that startup feel I think more than anything else. Consistency, quality control, that's really what we do. It's more of a labor of love, what we do. We're never going to settle with the conventional uh, ideas. We're always going to push the envelope. I think Glenmore is really nestled into a, a, a really nice niche, servicing uh, food and beverage companies in the local market. That's really what we've been able to do. Where, where we're going is being able to service our customers better um, and do a great job at, um, at quality control and just make sure that people are happy. Thank you, thank you. I know, I know, I deserve that. I worked hard for that, thank you. Uh, welcome back everybody, hope you had a great lunch. Uh, we're here for the end, last two sessions of 2021 BeerCon, which I think we can all agree has been a huge success. And I'm really looking forward to these last two sessions. They're gonna be very informative. Um, the first session is with the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, and I will be back at the end of it to do a Q&A with Shandi and Kevin. And with that, I will turn you over to Mr. Sepkowitz of Glenmore Packaging and Printing. Just kidding, he couldn't make it, it's me, I'm still here. Um, Kevin Smith is the manager of the Food Compositional Standards and Grades at the CFIA. He is currently responsible for all Canadian food compositional standards. Uh, at CFIA, his team worked collaboratively to amend the federal beer compositional standard found in the food and drug relations. And he's gonna be talking to us today about the new uh, labeling standards. Shondi McDonald is policy and programs team leader, industry relations at CFIA. She joined the Canadian Food Inspection Agency in 2008 after gaining 10 years experience in quality assurance and regulatory affairs in the private sector. Shandi has worked on a variety of different files in her time at the agency. She's currently in the industry relations section, working with national industry associations in the manufactured food sector. And uh, she's going to be talking to us today about traceability. Welcome both, and I'll be back at the end for Q&A. Thank you. All right, pleased to be here. Can everybody uh, see me and hear me? Yes, perfect. Okay. So thank you very much for the opportunity. As mentioned, I'm, uh, I'm Kevin Smith and uh, myself and my colleague Shandi are going to go through some beer labeling, uh, traceability and some other requirements that may uh, apply to you as, as brewers. So I wanted to start off um, with a mention of the Canadian, the Canadian beer standard and the Canadian beer standard would be a good segue into uh, 
um, talking about the new labeling requirements. And we do have uh, some slides that uh, that we'll try to put up. Um, but uh, I had the uh, the opportunity, and the privilege to work with several brewers over from about the period of 2014 to about 2019, really developed uh, a uniquely Canadian uh, beer standard. And this was uh, a lot of work, but we got it done over the five year period. And I have the, had the privilege of traveling around uh, uh, some of the Vancouver breweries with Ken at the time. And he was very gracious to take me around and, and show me some of their breweries to make sure we really had things right with the standard. And so that was a, a great opportunity and appreciated everybody's input into the beer standard and, and answering questionnaires and contributing to all the documents. Um, so as far as the beer standard goes, we can go to the beer standard slide. Um, so if there's ever a discussion on what's beer, what is not beer, is this a beer, is this not a beer? I mean, one of the places you can look is that is in the food and drug regulations because Canada uh, does have a beer standard. We do have a, a, a definition uh, for beer and it's uh, actually, I think uh, one we can be very proud of. Some countries don't uh, have a standard at all and, and Canada actually does. And uh, as I mentioned, we came into force, well, it was amended in 2019, and now we're going through this transition period to have it fully enforced by 2020. And, and quickly, uh, our, our beer standard, and this isn't uh, completely reproduced, but it's basically beer's product of alcoholic fermentation of yeast or mixture of yeast and other microorganisms, an infusion of barley or wheat and hops and ops extract, and various sources of carbohydrates. And this is something that we really expanded on with the new uh, beer standard to make make sure that brewers are able to innovate, make sure they're able, it's clear that they include uh, herbs and spices. One of the good additions we made at the old standard said, talked about yeast only, we've expanded to other microorganisms. Uh, some change, some other changes we did on the next slide. Uh, it used to, the standard used to talk about a certain characteristic aroma uh, and taste of beer. It's, uh, it's recognized that all beers don't taste the same. And so by taking out this, this one aroma, taste and character of beer provision, it gives you a little bit more opportunity. And if we can go to the next uh, slide. Yeah, interesting, we, all, we also, uh, there used to be a, a separate, little bit of history, a separate standard for ale actually. So you could actually have an ale, strong ale and nowhere on that label would you have to say anything about that this is a beer. So now we have uh, one beer standard and certainly ale porter, stout, malt liquor, IPA, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These are all now beers, beer styles and we have one standard uh, for beer. Within the standard, we's, we've also, if, if you ever uh, go to look at that, uh, there used to be a, a food additives list and we talk a lot about processing age. We've taken all that out to rely on Health Canada's list of, of food additives. So next slide, what really um, helps with defining a beer is we have a new requirement for a max percentage of uh, residual sugar at 4%. And this is really to help maintain the and integrity of what beer is to avoid it getting into these sweeter malt-based beverages. So this is this cutoff and it helps you distinguish between, um, you know, what's a beer and what's maybe a, or what's a beer and fruit juice blend? And at, at what point does that, does the beer more become into a beer and and juice blend because that does then affect labeling requirements and, and what kind of product that is. So as far as labeling, beer labeling goes, um, what hasn't changed is we still have uh, the beers labeled as extra light beer, light beer, beer, strong beer, or extra strong beer, depending on the alcohol content. And um, <clears throat> everyone seems to be doing that now. So so that 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 really continues. And of course, on a label, you know, these are the, the regulatory uh, wording that gets used, but certainly there's, as, as you're doing now, you know, you're calling it, you have your fanciful name for, you know, super duper hoppy IPA and that's sort of the, the big print and, and, and all that's good. As far as the regulations go, this talking about the beer really describes the, the alcohol content for consumers. Now, as we, on the next slide, as we were developing uh, this beer stand and we started developing it, Health Canada approach us and say, hey, you know, there's, there's right now, there's this exemption uh, from the labeling of food allergens, gluten sources, acid sulfites, you know, Health Canada, as Health Canada concerning about health of welfare consumers as, as everyone has, 
we're no longer comfortable with beer having this exemption. So previously beer did not need to include uh, that you had any food allergens, gluten sources and added sulfites. So this is something new that, that now you do have to declare these food allergens, gluten sources and sulfites, added sulfites if you're using that. And there's different ways of doing it. Uh, one is you can either use an ingredient list that I'm gonna talk about on the next slide or in a contained statement. So like an example of a, a contained statement is just bold print contains colon and then wheat comma barley is the most uh, common what you're gonna see. Uh, you may have other allergens. Uh, everyone's being more and more innovative and putting more and more things in their beer. So other allergens, you know, any kind of dairy, uh, milk, wheat, tree nuts and peanuts, eggs, fish and seafood, mustard seeds. So these are allergens that need to, uh, need to be declared on, on the label of beer. Um, and because this is a mandatory federal requirement, then the whole English and French uh, part kicks in. And, and certainly I could talk a lot about uh, font sizes and how, how this is all supposed to look, but, but you know, just be very conscious that, that you know, people need to be able to read this. And just a, a, a thing about the allergen you know, declaration, and this was really highlighted, it was amazing the amount of comments we got about allergen declaration uh, that, that you know, even if uh, maybe the kids had certain allergies and the parents were of course the beer drinkers, even if they weren't allergic, they would still look at a beer and go, oh, wow, that's you know, really great that that brewery is labeling all the allergens and has a constrained statement. That's really apply to me. I'm not allergic. However, it's good to know that they're conscious of their consumers, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So we really got a lot of that comments, just, just that, that this is good to, to have, um, you know, because if you don't, there, there are really going to be some questions. Uh, so talking on the next slide about uh, the new ingredient list, format. So this, this applies to um, all foods other than, as I said, uh, beer is exempt from an ingredient list. So you don't need ingredient list unless you're using that, unless you're using that to uh, declare your allergens. So this is just an example that I've pulled off a larger thing. This looks like this might be cookies, uh, uh, who knows, but it sort of shows bold face ingredients then you can either use a comma or the new way you're going to be seeing more and more of is actually a dot in between. And I don't have enough time to, you know, go through the details of, of the sizes of all this, but, but it just it sort of shows you what, what a really nice ingredient list and contains uh, layout looks like. And another thing you're going to see coming up is the sugars uh, that are, what's also new is that sugars, if this applies to you or not, uh, sugars are, are going to be grouped together. So you're going to see that, uh, coming up in, in, in foods where it's sugars and then they have to name the sugar where previously the sugars would be sort of distributed amongst the ingredient list. And ingredient lists are always the first uh, first ingredient, the heaviest ingredient, the one you use most of uh, first. So that's an example of uh, the uh, ingredient list. Uh, next slide. So another new beer labeling requirement as a result of the standard, <clears throat> and this goes along with uh, where you do now declare your that it's beer, uh, and you're doing that in English and French now. If this is a flavored, if there are a flavoring preparations, then the beer standard requires that you include that flavored. So we do have now the concept of, of a flavored beer. So a beer with blueberry flavor or blueberry flavored beer, and that would actually have to go right with in conjunction with where you have that that beer declaration now in English and French. So that is is something new. Um, and uh, so that's about it for me. This beer standard comes into force uh, 14th December 2022, and we do have uh, that date as well for um, the various labeling initiatives that, that are going on as far as uh, uh, the CFIA goes. And this is our website. Uh, this was a very quick overview, but certainly any, you know, you can Google CFIA beer standard or go to this website and put in uh, beer standard or beer and you'll come up with some nice history on, on the development of the beer standard and, and our specific requirements for nutrition labeling. So be, be pleased to, uh, to answer any questions after and I'll let, uh, I'll let Shandi uh, jump in now. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for inviting me to participate in your BC Craft Brewers Conference. Um, today I'll be covering uh, the timelines for the manufactured food sector and how they've been impacted by the pandemic. 
And a very brief overview of the three main components of the Safety for Canadians regulations. So licensing, preventive controls, and traceability. And also, um, I will point to key guidance documents that are available on our website. Um, I think the organizers are going to make the presentation available somehow. And so you'll be able to access the hyperlinks um, from the presentation when you're in the reading view. So um, as you may know, in January 2019, the Safe Food for Canadians regulations came into force for those who were subject to registrations under the former uh, commodity regulation. So this would be meat, fish, eggs, dairy, honey, maple, et cetera. Um, but the manufactured food sector, which is where beverage alcohol falls, um, they were given an extra 18 months in order to comply. So last summer, um, July 15th, the licensing and traceability requirements came into force uh, for the manufactured food sector, regardless of business size. And preventive control and preventive control requirement uh, plan uh, for the manufactured food sector um, either have come into force or will come into force um, this summer, July 15th, 2021, depending on business size. And I will speak to this a bit later in the presentation. Um, so these dates were sort of written in legislation. And so um, last March when COVID started impacting uh, the way businesses operated, we weren't able to change the coming into force dates to provide relief to industry. But what we could do was um, decide not to prioritize compliance activities at this time. And so this means essentially for the time being that um, you will be able to, for example, continue to import um, ingredients without a license. Um, but we do urge you to work towards um, compliance um, as you're able, um, if you haven't already done so. And any changes to CFIA's prioritization of these compliance activities will be announced with uh, plenty of lead time once the situation allows. And you can find out more by going to our website. We have a COVID-19 for industry page. Um, and this is an example of one of the hyperlinks um, that will work when you have the presentation. So I'll move on to licensing. So it has come into force um, for all manufactured food businesses who manufacture, process, treat, preserve, grade, package, or label food for interprovincial trade or export, businesses who import food, and those who export food if they're requesting an export certificate from um, CFIA. However, as you may know, some food commodities are exempt from the requirement for a license. And this includes alcoholic beverages that contain more than 0.5% absolute ethyl alcohol by volume. However, um, you might be conducting activities that would require you to hold a license. So I just wanted to cover these things. So if you're importing food ingredients, for example, uh, pelletized hops, fruit, yeast, spices, et cetera, then you might need a license. Um, if you're manufacturing other foods that are not exempt, uh, maybe non-alcoholized beer or other beverages with less than 0.5% alcohol, or if you're exporting and you would like um, an export certificate from the CFIA. So if you do determine that you need a license, you can obtain one by using the My CFIA portal. And through this portal, you can apply for the license, you can pay for the license, you can track the status of your license, um, you could print a copy when it's approved, that sort of thing. Um, and you are encouraged to enroll in my CFIA now so that you're ready to apply for a license um, when you need one. And in order to help you manage your my CFIA account, we've created step-by-step -step user guides, um, there's videos and that sort of thing. And if you consult the guidance and you still can't you know, find an answer to your question, we have a 1-800 number for the licensing application and you can call and an agent will um, help you through the process. And all of this information can be found following um, the link on this page. 
And so um, after each sub subtopic in the presentation, I've included a slide with key guidance materials and resources to help you navigate your way through. So I'll just draw your attention um, on this slide to the licensing interactive tool, which is a great resource for businesses to determine um, whether you need a license or not. Um, and when you apply for your license, um, you will need to choose which types of food you manufacture. So the document um, called what to consider before applying for a safe food for Canadians license will help you to understand those subcategories under manufactured food and how to um, choose the right category. So I'll just move on to preventive controls. Um, these don't apply to alcoholic beverages, as I mentioned before, but if you determine that you need to have a license, then you'll also need to have preventive control. So I just wanted to cover them briefly. So they're based on internationally recognized principles of food hygiene, um, and they're basically a combination of measures um, used to prevent food safety hazards and to reduce the likelihood um, of contaminated food entering the market, whether it was prepared like inside of Canada or outside of Canada. Um, and the requirements have come into force um, for most businesses in the manufactured food sector. However, uh, businesses that have less than five employees or less than $100,000 um, in gross annual sales from food have until July 15, 2021 to have their preventive controls in place. And again, just a reminder that we currently have uh, enforcement discretion due to the pandemic. So basically the intent of preventive controls um, are to ensure the operator is aware of and controls the food safety hazards relevant to their food operation. The processing environment and practices are hygienic. Um, the facility equipment and conveyances are not a source of contamination. Employees understand their role in food safety. And finally, that there's a system in place to rapidly identify and remove harmful food from the marketplace. And the preventive controls in the SFCR were written to be outcome based where possible um, to allow for flexibility and innovation. So for example, rather than stipulating the number of floor drains required, um, an outcome based requirement would simply state that there must be no standing water on the floor. And this also allows for scalability. And so it works well for small businesses um, without adding undue burden or requirements that are cost prohibitive since it doesn't focus on um, the how, but rather on the what. Um, so these are some resources for preventive controls. And then um, I'll move on to uh, preventive control plan. So if you require a license, and preventive controls, then you'll also likely need to have a preventive control plan or a PCP, um, which is a written document that demonstrates how risks to food are identified and controlled. And these controls are based on um, hazard analysis critical control principles. And again, there is a small business exemption for this that may apply if your gross annual food sales are $100,000 or less. And if the exemption applies to you, you aren't required to prepare, keep, and maintain a written PCP. However, you must still comply with the preventive controls as well as the documentation requirements related to complaints and recalls. Um, so there are two main components to a preventive control plan, the food safety part and the consumer protection part. So just briefly for the food safety part, um, your plan must include a description of each uh, biological, chemical, and physical hazard. Control measures to prevent, eliminate, or reduce the hazards to an acceptable level. And evidence that the control measures are effective and a description of your critical control points. And you must also keep documents um, that prove you have implemented your PCP for two years. And for the consumer protection part, uh, the document must um, include the measures that you've taken to ensure that any labeling, packaging, or net quantity requirements um, are met. And here are uh, quite a lot of resources for the preventive control plan. There's some templates, there's you know how to do a hazard analysis, all that kind of stuff, if this happens to apply to you. So we'll move on to traceability, which does apply to beverage alcohol. And um, 
The traceability requirements also align with international standards, such as Codex, and they support food safety investigations, including recalls by tracing the food one step forward and one step back through the supply chain. The traceability requirements apply to an even broader scope of food and businesses than the licensing and preventive controls. So for example, traceability applies to um, grains, alcoholic beverages, food additives, wholesalers, uh, distributors, um, retail stores. Um, but traceability does not apply to restaurants um, and cafeterias. So there are two main components to traceability, uh, documentation requirements and labeling requirements. So for the documentation requirements, there are three main pieces of information um, that you need to prepare and keep in a document. So the first um, is used to identify the food you provide so this is using the common name, the name and principal place of business, by whom or for whom the food was manufactured, prepared, produced, stored, packaged, or labeled, and the lock code or other unique identifier to allow them to be traced. The next piece of information is used to trace back the food and any other ingredients you use to prepare the food. So specifically, this is the date on which the food or food ingredients were provided to you and by whom they were provided. And the last piece of information is used to trace forward the food. And this is the date you provide the food and to whom you provided the food to. And just a note that trace forward does not apply um, to the sale of food to consumers. Okay, and the sec second, <clears throat> excuse me, the second component to traceability is labeling. So you're required to make sure that the food that you provide to another person has a label with the following information applied, attached, or accompanying it. The common name, the name and principal place of business, and a unique identifier or lock code. However, for consumer prepackages, such as like a case of beer, for example, it must be a lock code. And just to give you a little bit of background, unique identifier um, was added based on comments we received at Canada Gazette part one to provide greater flexibility for food that's not packaged in consumer prepackages. And here are some um, resources that you can uh, check out later for traceability. So as I mentioned previously, all the hyperlinks in the presentation are active um, from the reading view in PowerPoint. So hopefully you'll find it a helpful resource. Um, but if you want to go to our website, um, if you go to inspection.gc.ca forward slash safe food, then you will start here on this landing page that's show, shown on the screen. And if you select and um, toolkit for businesses, it will connect you to the interactive tools the timelines and all the guidance documents that we've discussed today. And new on our um, website is this virtual assistant, this sort of headphones with the maple leaf. So if you click on that, um, it'll ask you a few um, questions and then it will try to um, suggest documents that it thinks it will be helpful in your search. So finally, um, if you have questions, if they're on the licensing um, application process specifically, this is the 1-800 number to call. Um, and if you have any other questions that you can't find answers to um, relating to your business, um, you can um, use this form to send your questions into the CFIA. And we also encourage you to stay connected. So we have, uh, you could sign up for our email notification service. You could follow us on social media or subscribe to our newsletter. So I know I covered a lot of material today very quickly, um, but thank you so much for taking the time to learn more about the Safe Food for Canadians regulations. And so my colleague Kevin and I would be happy to take any questions you might have about the presentation um, via the chat function. Thank you very much, Kevin and Shandi, for taking the time today. We're a very heavily regulated industry and it's nice to be able to 
form a, a connection with government sometimes for us. So there are a number of questions um, for Kevin to start. Um, Warren is wondering if the 4% max sugar is specific to finishing additions. I'd imagine there are breweries that are making big pastry stouts with lactose additions that would come in at higher than 4%. Yeah, so it applies at the like the final food. So at the very end um, is where the four percent would would fall. The packaged product. Yeah, packaged product. Yeah, um, and then uh, when we're talking about the the flavored beers, does it matter at what point you add the flavors? Is it post fermentation, pre fermentation? If all of the flavor is fermented out, still has to be on the label. Well, it was more to express that the beer is flavored at the end. Actually, that's a good question. I've never really had that, but if, I mean, it's it's just to say that your beer, like that it's a flavored beer for the consumer. So it's information for the consumer. Okay, because so sometimes we're adding flavored purees, but sometimes we're adding the actual fruit. Whatnot. Um, Rick is wondering, is there a technical difference between ingredients and contains, the two terms? So ingredients is, is in front of the ingredient list, and then that's the full ingredient list. And then the contains is where you put the allergens, the gluten source, and the added sulfite if, if you're doing that. Okay. So the ingredients is the ingredient list, and the contained statement is a statement for the allergens and the gluten sources. Ah, okay. Yeah, makes sense. And a follow-up question about sugars. Does that include non-fermentable sugar, too, if it's in the... Uh, this, so this is the small, uh, simple sugars or the disaccharide, so it doesn't include the larger ones. So I'm, I'm pretty sure it's, it's just the, the mono and disaccharides. Okay. Okay, good. Um, Joanne was wondering about the, uh, in the common name, beer with blueberry, blueberry flavor is acceptable as well as blueberry flavored beer. Does it matter how we... Does, does not matter. The, the, the regulations say the name of any flavoring preparation added to the beer shall form part of the common name of the beer. And the common name is, you know, extra light beer, light beer, beer. So it doesn't matter if it's before or after, or, as long as it's there with the name. As long as it's in there. Great. Yeah. Uh, and then Megan asks, do the ingredients lists need to be in a white box with black text or can they color coordinate with labels as long as they are legible? Yeah, there's no, um, like where you see, you know, the white, the, the thing around it is, is more for uh, nutrition labeling, which is not mandatory for beer. That's where you sort of have the box and it's white and black and, and the ingredient list is, uh, it, it's pretty much as it is today and, and good practice just to have a look at you know, we're basically treating beer like any other food. So, you know, go to your grocery store and have a look at, at uh, a can or whatever other product and sort of see how they're doing it already. And, and you, can, you can try to mimic that. Thank you. And then one more question. How do gluten-free beers fit into the CFIA's definition of beer where the main fermentable is not from barley or wheat, but a gluten-free ingredient like sorghum or rice? Yeah, so that's a good so that's a good question because the the beer standard does require a certain amount of uh, uh, barley or wheat. It, you know, it doesn't say how much barley or wheat, but but CFI is sort of traditionally sort of allowed as a as a modified common name, so gluten free beer, and we haven't really been running around uh, objecting to those kind of products. And and there's different ways to make gluten uh, free beer. I mean, the one is where you don't have barley or wheat, and the other one is where you try to reduce uh, the gluten through an enzymatic uh, process. But but um, for where you're using the other the other sugars, um, or sorry, the other carbohydrates that are not barley or wheat, we've we haven't really been objecting, uh, running around objecting to that. Great. And one more question about flavor. Um, can I use lime gosa uh, or do I have to have the word flavored in it? Lime flavored gosa. We have a number of products already that will already have the fruit name in it. Yeah, so there is, there is the, you know, we, we do understand there's a difference between the actual ingredient and more of a flavor preparation concentrate. So we're, you know, your, your judgment is, is this some kind of a flavor preparation concentrate or is it the actual ingredient? And if you're using the actual ingredient, you know, then, um, you know, then maybe it's not, it, it's more, 
um, that you can just name that ingredient without having to say the flavored. Okay. Okay, and I think that that was uh, all the questions for Kevin. And then for Shandi, there's a few for you. Um, Nancy is wondering, did I understand correctly that if you're producing beers with alcohol less than 0.5% that you do need a CFIA license? Yes, that's true because um, the threshold for the definition of alcoholic beverages is 0.5%. So any beverages with less than 0.5% would just be con like wouldn't be included in the alcohol beverages category. And so then they would not be exempt okay. from the licensing requirement. Okay. And um, is there an annual fee for the license? Yes, it's approximately $250 for two years. Okay. Okay. Um, if we declare products like beer with less than 100 calories, what kind of supporting document or testing is required? Uh, so you can say, say that again? If we declare products like beer with less than 100 calories, so a low calorie beer, what kind of supporting document or testing is required? I'm not sure if that applies to traceability. That might be a question for um, the LDB, really. No, I'm not sure. Yeah, that doesn't come up. I imagine within your program and how you're doing it. Yeah, I'm not. We'll have to go sure. elsewhere to, to answer that question. Yeah. Um, are there any regulations on can weights and how much variance is allowed per lot? I think that's also not relevant to this discussion. Um, do all additives such as fining agents, um, fermentation caps, et cetera, do they need lot codes? They need to be captured in your lot code from my understanding. Oh, sorry, could you um, list the examples again? <laughs> So fining agents, so we use things um, to filter the beer without running it through a filter. So, uh, so fining agents, um, and there was also a question about uh, things coming from the grocery store. Do they, do they also need to be form part of your traceability program? It would definitely be a good practice to know where all of um, the inputs are coming from. Um, for a fining agent where it's incorporated, but then it doesn't, I'm assuming it doesn't end up in the final product. It's more of a processing aid. It probably doesn't, but it would be good practice to keep track of that sort of thing, just in case there was a problem uh, with right. any of the ingredients. So this isn't triggering uh, an ingredients list necessarily. I'd have to refer to Kevin on that. I, I'm not sure. So, so you don't need, um, on beer, you don't need an ingredient list. Okay. Unless that's the way you want to declare your allergens. Right. So it's much easier to just have a contained statement because if you do have an ingredient list, then it has to be a complete ingredient list. So okay. if you are using a bunch, if you are using food additives, then those would technically need to be listed like as, as any other food. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And Ken is reminding us all that uh, we have a webinar on traceability up on the Canadian Craft Brewers Association site, which you can find at ccba.org um, and in our community here on, uh, on BC Craft Brewers. So if there are no other questions, there is one. Does a contract brewed beer have to have the contract brewer name on the label? Um, yeah, if that's one of those by like for whom situations, then yeah, it would be, um, it would be, and we do have some guidance document um, on the website that like explains um, it in greater detail, it gives examples so you can see yourself in that situation. Is it, this is just my own question, is it, um, extensive to, to apply for the license? Does it require a lot of time or is it just simply going in and filling out the form, paying the fee? No, so I've been told that the actual, like applying for the license part takes between 30 and 60 minutes. Okay. Um, but there are some like things um, that you need to have in order to complete the whole thing. So that's kind of why they're recommending like go in, 
start the process. Like there's tombstone information you have to enter in, but it also tells you what other documents you need to keep going. So you need like a, this isn't my area of expertise, but I think you need like a government of Canada business number. Right. Um, you need to have like your GC key or it's right. kind of like the way you can react, like interact with CRA and other government um, right, right, right. Stations, and it just like sort of proves who you are. Yeah. And then throughout the, and then in the process, there's some things that you have to um, fill out. Like I mentioned, like the categories of food that you're producing. And then there's options to decide, like you can have one license that covers, like if you have multiple businesses, or you can choose to get a license for each individual business that you have. Okay. And so these are the kinds of decisions that you have to make. But once you go in, I think it like gives you kind of a checklist of all the things. Okay. Um, so it is useful um, to do that. And there's pros and cons um, to that as well. But when you, um, when you go do the final um, applying for the license, I believe you have to attest that you have your preventive control plan in place. So um, you can sort of, apply up to that point, but then don't click on it unless you really do have your preventive control yeah, plan okay. in place. Okay. Yeah. okay, well, I think that's all the questions that we had for you. I want to thank you again for taking the time. We really do appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was fantastic. Yeah, thank you for having us. My pleasure. Thank you. So before we uh, transfer over to Mr. Crandall and his, I'm sure, riveting talk on uh, software, we uh, just wanted to give a shout out to Ken Beatty, who is our executive director. I don't know if any of you have ever met him, but he's uh, hardworking, enthusiastic. Uh, you know, I, I sit on the board with Ken. He is very good natured. He takes a lot of ribbing. I think you've all seen it here this week. He has a determination. He works on our behalf constantly. And uh, the folks here at The Number have put together a short reel of his um, accomplishments for us to enjoy. So enjoy. See you at the quiz. <laughs>